And in the case of Hong Kong, it has become one country, one system,、um, without any protection for our freedom, democracy, and rule of law. So I think、uh, the lesson is actually learned, and Taiwanese people and people around the world can clearly see that、um, it is not a promise that worthwhile believing in. And、um, I think、um, we we all know that what happens in Hong Kong. Or will happen to to anywhere else. Taiwan is definitely the target of Chinese government, and people are now discussing Taiwan is a nest, a zone or a area that war would happen just like the Ukraine Ukrainian war. I think there is a very high possibility that the Chinese government would take the military action toward Taiwan. But I would say. Uh, just like Hong Kong, what we can do now is to do more international connection. Comparisons have been made between Hong Kong and Taiwan, but the differences are many. What's clear is that both are suffering from the increasing authoritarianism of communist China. So, should these threats unite Hong Kong and Taiwan? Welcome to Taiwan Plus Point, offering insight and analysis on the latest global news from a Taiwan perspective. I'm Ian Kavat, and today I'm joined by Nathan Law, democracy activist and former Hong Kong legislator, who joins us from the UK, and Jiang Minyan,、uh, chair of Taiwan-based Hong Kong Outlanders and Economic Democracy Union researcher, who joins us in the studio. Thank you both for joining us. Today, Nathan, you fled Hong Kong directly before Beijing imposed the national security law. At that time, you understood what it meant, and you predicted many of the things that would happen to Hong Kong. Has there been anything over the past two years that has surprised you? I left Hong Kong a few days before、um, the implementation of the national security law、um, in June 2020 because we foresaw that it would be a law that criminalised free speech and、um, become a, a legal weapon to put democratic activists behind bars. And in two years of its implementation, we could see that、uh, that was exactly the way it evolves and、um, the way that Beijing government used to、um, to persecute、uh, democratic campaigners. There have already been more than a hundred cases. Was there anything、um, that went beyond your expectations that you were surprised about? I think the speed of the deterioration of Hong Kong、um, has been quite surprising.、Um, we indeed、um, predicted that、um, the erosion of freedom in Hong Kong would continue, but、um, the implementation of the national security law was like、um, Hong Kong falling off the cliff, and all of our freedoms, including. Our political freedom, freedom of speech,、um, were all gone in one day. So that was、um, a, a shocking speed,、uh, and that really caught many of us off guard.、Um, but I think the general trajectory of how Beijing would deal with Hong Kong, how it would close down its civil space and civil society,、um, what was actually、um, we were actually expecting that coming. Nathan John Lee, the incumbent. Uh, Chief Executive, he has said the national security law has succeeded in restoring peace and order, and people like him actually say that the national security law was necessitated by the violent protests of 2019. What do you say to that? The sole purpose of the national security law was to destroy Hong Kong civil society and make people to lose their rights to speak up and to protest.、Um, so to Um, make、um, the diversity and also the vibrant nature of our civil society gone.、Um, because if there is only one voice, it means that、um, no, no, no accountability are being held.、Um, the government is doing whatever they want. Do you? What do you say to that? And if you could have that time again, would you have done anything differently? If I look back to、um, the 2019 movement, I would say that we should. Be more prepared for setbacks, for、um, defeat,、um, because we were so energized about、um, kind of like conquering the hurdles, and and most of us saw that as one last chance of Hong Kong resistance. So、um, it, it, when 
um, the result was Beijing crackdown came in a ferocious way, then a lot of people were not prepared. And um, I, I think we should definitely do more um, preparation on that regard. So to kind of like listen the pressure and um, the attacks Beijing launched to us afterwards. In terms of what you said you would have done differently, can I just try to understand what that was in terms of how you reacted to the, the crackdown of Beijing? Well, I, I think at least we, we needed to have more discussion on how we live in a totalitarian society because uh, it was obvious that after the implementation of the national security law, Hong Kong was transiting um, in, in a transition to um, uh, authoritarian police state. Um, our actions are being monitored. The room for public events are not available. The room for um, political dissidents is severely curtailed and limited. And how we can live our lives um, under that condition without losing our passion for democracy and also can continue to talk about um, politics in a more convoluted way, probably. Um, so these are the things that we should have thought about. Um, and also building up um, hierarchy, uh, building up some um, infrastructure on assisting political prisoners um, under the water. Um, all, all those things um, could be developed um, at earliest stage. And how about the violence of the protests? Is that something that you regret now? Well, I don't think I'm in no position um, to regret anything because I was not a leader. I was not ordering all, all these attacks. But um, I, I think that is definitely. Um, a very sad thing to see. Um, Hong Kong people didn't want violence, but they were forced to do it. Because um, if we look at the root cause why there were violence from the police, uh, from the protester side, it was because um, the use of force um, from the police um, w was not held accountable. They could do it without any punishment, um, so that the use of force was extremely unpro um, unproportionate. And if we look back, there were none of the police who committed police violence were um, were, were under an investigation or even um, any form of arrest. Um, so I think um, the the involvement of the adoption of force from the protest sides was because they wanted deterrence effect um, to the police violence, and they adopted that start strategy. Maybe not all of us will agree that, but um, I think the root cause is uh, the unlimited police violence. And if we wanted to um, change the situation, we have to increase the accountability on the police side rather than just blaming the protesters because they were literally fa facing a lot of lethal um, use of force um, on a daily basis. And we could imagine that um, they desperately need certain deterrence um, towards those degree of violence. I want to bring Min Yen um, in now. As a Hong Kong graduate, how have you felt seeing the changes in Hong Kong? To be honest, I feel very angry. I feel very angry about what Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party has done in Hong Kong. I studied undergraduate since 2014 in Hong Kong at that time. Hong Kong is a free society as we know before and is in some sense is even freer than Taiwan and Hong Kong has a very strong tradition of civil society and actually I would say I learned a lot from Hong Kong especially because I'm an undergraduate and I same as Nathan we, are, we were all involved in the student movement and in the university, we will elect our own student union. The tradition of the student union, the tradition of the student who can govern themselves in the campus, it is even stronger than in Taiwan's campus. So I learned a lot from Hong Kong, especially from the Hong Kong young people, the younger generation. But now, all of, I would say, all the NGO network, all, almost all the student unions, almost all the self-organizing uh, network in Hong Kong are all destroyed under the national security law. And the Chinese government, they, did, they does not allow any space for the people to voice out, to keep fighting for democracy. 
So I feel very angry. But can I ask you, seeing all that in Hong Kong, did it make you think about Taiwan's future? And did it make you think Taiwan could be next? Taiwan is definitely the target of Chinese government. And people are now discussing Taiwan is the next uh, zone or uh, area that war would happen just like the Ukraine, Ukrainian war. I think there is a very high possibility that the Chinese government would take the military action toward Taiwan. But I would say, uh, just like Hong Kong, what we can do now is to do more international connection. We have the military, but Hong Kong people they don't have. And that is what Taiwanese people can do now. And we should learn from Hong Kong and to notice the future of Taiwan is not optimistic. And yeah, that is my viewpoint about it. Nathan, the um, national security law asserts jurisdiction over anyone on the planet if they endanger national security, China's, Hong Kong's national security. So can you tell us how safe are you in the UK? Even though I'm in the UK, um, I cannot say that I'm completely safe. Um, for now, I've got my asylum status, so I sh I'm supposed to be protected right here. But we all understand that how far reaching China's reach could be. But in terms of the other um, harassment, I think mostly are online ones that they um, have fabricated stories that they launch this information and campaign in order to discredit me and attack me um, in a way that um, uh, 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 does not fit into reality. What are some of the things that these disinformation campaigns are spreading about you? Well, it was funny because like they, they had fabricated stories about how I got involved in activism saying that I, um, I, I lost um, millions of money um, in mainland China so that I, I, I decided to become a dissident in order to portray me as like a money seeking guy. Um, they've also accused me of like being trained by CIA, by the military of the US and getting money from them. These are all wrong, but um, they are there to create a perception that I'm doing things for the so-called um, hostile foreign forces and doing it for money instead of my um, devotion, instead of my vocation for democracy in Hong Kong. So that's how they um, kind of like um, um, painted picture in order to um, decrease my credibility. Um, sadly, that there, there, there are very few that pick them up and the international community are fully aware of this campaign. I wonder, have you noticed any change in your democracy advocacy work since the start of the war in Ukraine? The advocacy work has always been um, constantly evolving because it has to fit into the context of um, the people who are listening and also, um, well, um, having it connected to um, current affairs. So definitely after the uh, Ukraine war started, um, after um, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, that um, there are a lot more discussion on how we um, kind of like collectively defend our democracy worldwide, how we collectively push back all these threats from dictators and started to discuss how we can shield ourselves uh, from the influence of Russia and also China by decreasing our reliance and um, being economically independent from, from them. So I guess um, the discussion has shifted. And um, for me, I would definitely believe that it raised the awareness of the world about the rise of authoritarianism and the possible military conflict and the consequence of it. Um, so that they actually, when they look into Russia, they also pay more attention to China, that um, they are more aware of what they've been doing um, in terms of um, discrediting or dismantling our democracy. Um, Nathan, you are fighting for democracy in Hong Kong, but isn't it true that this is a very tough ask because Hong Kong will become no different to communist China? Well, all of our passion are big asks. If we are saying that 
is Taiwan independence a big ask? Anyone would say yes, but it doesn't mean that we or the people believing that will stop pursuing it. I think the same case applies to Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong um, democracy is definitely difficult to achieve. There are a lot of different elements that we needed um, to see in order to make it happen. For example, um, maybe a change of policy or even change of regime in mainland China. Um, the, the the kind of like determination of Hong Kong people to fight for um, a self determined future, etc. So I I do think that is a big task. I uh, I I don't think I'm able to go back to Hong Kong for let's say within a decade or even takes a few decades. But I genuinely believe that this is a cause that worth our trial and also is a cause that will benefit millions of Hong Kong people, and we should. Keep fighting, regardless of how difficult it is. Nathan, when the UK handed control of Hong Kong back to the People's Republic of China in 1997, it was under Beijing's one country, two systems model. This model has also been offered to Taiwan. There are similarities between Hong Kong and Taiwan, but also differences. How do you think Taiwan can learn from Hong Kong? to avoid going down the same route? Taiwanese people in Taiwan um, have already rejected the idea of one country, two system um, from previous events. And they, um, they clearly see that one country, two system is just a lie that uh, let one country dominate two system that makes China easier to control everything under that two system. And in the case of Hong Kong, it has become one country, one system, um, without any protection for our freedom, democracy, and rule of law. So I think a uh, lesson is actually learned, and Taiwanese people and people around the world can clearly see that um, it is not a promise that worthwhile believing in. And um, I think um, we we all know that what happens in Hong Kong. Or will happen to to anywhere else. If um, Min Yen, in the past two years, there have been many Hong Kongers who have immigrated to Taiwan. But unlike the UK or Canada, Taiwan hasn't created a special visa program for Hong Kongers. Now, with your work with Outlanders, you work on a daily basis with immigrants from Hong Kong. What are their views about the process of coming to Taiwan? I would categorize the Hong Konger now in Taiwan into three types. The first one is they are all economic immigrants. So they could invest in Taiwan, they could uh, get the profession job in Taiwan, and then they can get the citizenship after one year or two year residency. And their life are really stable in Taiwan and the second type is those who study in Taiwan and they are mostly young people. And now they are deciding whether to leave Taiwan. Because if you get the working visa in Taiwan, just like you ask, our government does not allow them to get the citizenship in Taiwan. So they would have to choose to go to the UK or Canada to earn a longer living, a more stable life there. And the third type, I would say they are those asylum seekers. They have no choice. They have chosen Taiwan as their, as the press. They have to live longer here. So uh, they need help and they need longer visa. They need the chance, they need the legal way to apply for the citizenship. Uh, if the Taiwanese government now does not give any option or any opportunity for them, it will be very big trouble and violate the, the promise made by the President Chai in 2019. Mm. So what are your observations of Taiwan's support for Hong Kong? Has it changed over time? It seems that it has changed from the original promises. And 
Can we say that the national security law triggered some of those changes? Um, actually, before the national security law was implemented, uh, those asylum work in Taiwan were done by the civil society instead of the government. Uh, and I'm also part of the asylum network and in Taiwan, so we help them, I mean those asylum seekers from Hong Kong to get the residency here or to seek the psychotherapist or to find a doctor or to find a room, a house to rent and to find a school to find a job. Uh, because of the national security law, our government uh, just started to uh, uh, just start a new humanitarian scheme. They established a new office under the Mainland Affairs Office to take care of those asylum seekers. So, national security law in Hong Kong actually changed the policy route of the Thai government and there were some progresses. But the problem is after this humanitarian scheme, uh, they should be taken off in Taiwan, their life should be taken off, but the visa problem, the residency problem, how they can get a permanent residency or a citizenship is the next question after the national security law were implemented. Mm. So Minyan, cross-strait relations play a role um, in Taiwan's support for Hong Kong. How much of the frustrations of Hong Kongers coming to Taiwan can be explained by Taiwan's distrust and suspicions of the People's Republic of China? Um, to my observation, uh, during the protest in 2019, uh, there is a very big sympathy in the Taiwanese society because the Taiwanese general public they so the Hong Kong police use the force in a very extreme way to uh, against those protesters on the street. So people in Taiwan, they will be very willing to help this asylum seeker. But I would not say uh, at this point now, at this moment, the Taiwanese uh, society forget the Hong Kong asylum seeker. But uh, there are more and more extreme voice on the online, on the Facebook or Twitter, and those comments would hurt or they would see, they would regard the Hong Kong resident in Taiwan as Chinese, as the Chinese spy, mm -hmm. or the Chinese who were threat to our democracy. Uh, there are voices online, but I would not say it is the majority. Nathan, can I bring you in? I'm curious, what do your friends and former colleagues who have fled to Taiwan, what do they say about the process and what do they say about Taiwan's support? Well, of course, they, um, many of them are quite stressed uh, because uh, they are unable to assess or um, evaluate the future because um, for them, um, it's really difficult to have a long-term um, staying plan um, and a possible pathway for that. Um, so that would definitely be a problem for them. But I, I, I think this is, of course, um, a broader question is about how Taiwan society or the government would see its uh, refugee policy. This is a common topic um, discussion um, in, for example, European countries and the US that um, the society itself needs to have a consensus over how they would deal with a refugee um, problem or what refugee system in order to proceed. Um, for me, um, Hong Kong is just a big part of this discussion and we should not single out Hong Kong um, as one group of people that are actively seeking that. Minyan, you talked about some of the um, opinions online. Is this more organized than that? Is it actually disinformation campaigns perhaps coming from different camps, maybe even the PRC itself? Uh, actually, I do not have the evidence of the PR, uh, PRC's uh, disinformation campaign in this online comment. 
So I would not say or I would not regard LAN as the branch or part of PRC uh, sharp power. But uh, I think somehow it is the responsibility of the government, I mean our government. And in this, uh, I mean the recent event, I would say our legislature or legislator in Taiwan should take more responsibility on that. Because uh, on the very beginning, those extreme comments on the online, they just part of the uh, discussion. But our legislator, they did not analyze it. They did not uh, make study on it but reflect this extreme voice directly in the legislature and to let this comment become the true opinion, public opinion of Taiwanese people. So I think it is very improper for our legislator to do this kind of things. We should recognize that Hong Kong issue is a very uh, national security concern, but uh, because it is real, our legislators should be more careful uh, what they say or what they represent in the legislature. So I hope our politicians, especially in the legislature, they should do more study work. They should study to find the true policy solution to resolve how those asylum seekers can stay in Taiwan for a long time. Mm -hmm. Nathan, finally, hundreds of thousands of Hong Kongers have fled uh, or are in jail. For you, what do you see as Hong Kong's future? After Johnny was appointed as uh, the chief executive, the following five years would definitely be great. Um, he's notorious for his um, really um, authoritarian mindset and um, heavy-handed approach dealing with um, freedom fighting people um, so um, that that would definitely be no doubt we will be in other dark years um, but I do think that in the future um, in the long-term future that China's totalitarian model is not sustainable they are encountering so many problems including an aging population failure of industrial upgrades um, losing its competitive edge as a, a, a low-tier manufacturing country, etc. Um, all these things compound when the people feel like there must be a change, then there could be a possibility to change. Um, whether it will go to worse or better, we have no idea, but I think as long as there is possibility of change, there is hope. So I do feel like um, in the long-term future, things could be changed and I can finally go back to Hong Kong to see my friends and see my loved ones. So we'll have to end it there. Thank you to my guests Nathan Law and Chang Min Yen and thank you to the viewers for joining us on Point. For more information please download the Taiwan Plus app. Stay safe and see you next time.